Hello? Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for having us again uh, to speak on the main stage at FOSDEM. It's great to be here. My name is Guido. I'm a long-term FOSDEM attendee. I'm a Debian developer. In the spare time, I also work at Google. And uh, we're going to speak today about uh, Linux desktop on Chrome OS. Uh, the code name is Crostini. Um, myself, I joined Chrome OS a few months ago. So I couldn't miss an opportunity to come to one of my favorite conferences to speak for the first time in my life about Linux on the desktop. Um, so what will we go through? Um, we'll discuss a bit like this introduction, right? And then we'll go through a bit of getting started with Chrome OS and Crostini. Uh, we'll go through the architecture and my colleague Dylan, who is in the Mountain View team that implemented uh, the back end of Crostini and the virtual machine management on which it works will explain the internals and then we'll go through a small advanced usage demo or failing that miserably we'll go through slides that shows what the demo should have looked like in case things like go not right. Um, so this is our plan. Uh, you've all probably heard of Chrome OS. This is a Linux based operating system that is quite widely available but is also geared at a cloud type of work uh, based on Chrome. One of the most exciting things that happened to it was the development, or recently for people like us, was the development of Project Crostini, which is a Linux Debian container natively running, integrated into Chrome OS, so that you can run anything that you run normally on Linux in a Chrome OS machine, and you can give the Chrome OS machine to other people or you can use it and deploy it in your enterprise with the advantages of a simple and managed operating system while at the same time maintaining the flexibility of a Linux system. Um, given how widely available Chrome OS is, which is not like amazing in every country, but still in the US you can just go to a shop and buy one, right, like very easily, I would say that this is probably the closest, most available Linux desktop that just like comes there, right? So it's it's an interesting development. Um, so starting with Christine, once you have a Chrome OS machine, is very, very easy. You go to your settings, you turn on Linux, or you search for the terminal and you click it, right? And then this is installing, and then you get dropped at a prompt, right? And then this is Debian, and that's it, right? So this is probably the simplest installation of Linux that I have seen. Um, on Control Shift P, you see preferences. You can like adapt like size of a terminal and so on. And then you can install your applications, install your own terminal, do whatever you want. Um, once you install applications, they are integrated in Chrome OS. So here we installed a few development uh, environments, right? And then you can start them. Just like you click on Eclipse, it starts the window, any other development environment or your terminal and anything in the terminal, any other app, everything works. Uh, on top of that, file system and Google Drive sharing were integrated, so you can share a Google Drive folder with Crostini, or vice versa, you can access Linux files from the file manager inside Chrome OS, and so then you can save from your Linux programs inside, like Drive shared with Linux there, or, and then see it in Drive, see it on your other Chrome OS computer, all these kind of things or from Chrome OS you can manage Linux. Uh, clipboard integration works kind of. There are some restrictions related to the fact that uh, we don't want Linux to programmatically access anything that runs on Chrome OS, so you have to manually paste things in. This is to avoid uh, attacks in the Linux container that extract data out of Chrome OS without your wish. Uh, okay, so networking works, and once you start something in the container, for example Apache, you can just go to either Penguin Linux test or for many ports just on localhost, and you'll be redirected to the container where you can test your development results and so on before uploading. Okay, my clicker is misbehaving. Good. Um, you manage the settings just inside the Chrome OS settings, and 
there's like right now in dev a few settings there are more coming depending what we implement. I'll have to do it my way, sorry. Here. Uh, we have uh, some roadmap of things that we're already looking at. Uh, uh, USB pass through so that you can share a USB peripheral from your Chrome OS directly to your container. Uh, support for audio so you can play your favorite games, but also so you can like listen to things anyway, like audio integration. GPU integration also for any sort of development with 3D or anything else. And also Fuse is something that didn't work in the first version, but is coming in the next couple of versions. Um, working myself in Chrome OS Enterprise, I'm also going to mention about the enterprise and manageability features. So when you buy Chrome OS as a consumer, you won't see any of this. Uh, but if you buy a fleet of Chrome OS devices with enterprise management of them, then you can manage the whole fleet centrally from Google, or you can export your policies in other way, and they will all behave depending on that. So for Crostini, at the moment, we have only a few policies there's a device policy to turn it on and off. So if you don't want any of your people to use Crostini, you can avoid it. Uh, then if you turn it on, you can decide whether only members of your enterprise can use it and which users can, or whether uh, a user that is logged into the computer in case you allow friends or other people to log into the computer that are not your enterprise users, log in whether they can also use Crostini or not. Uh, this is just really a small stub, of course, as you can see. There is more enterprise features coming to make the container uh, controllable centrally, but we're going to talk about them when we have them and when we have designed them. This is what is coming relatively soon. Uh, I'm now going to pass on the microphone to my colleague Dylan, who's going to speak about the internals of the architecture of Crostini and how it came to be and what is it inside. Thank you very much, and see you later for the demo. Thank you. All right, so Chrome OS is already kind of a desktop Linux. We run on a Linux kernel. We have a user space that's built from Gentoo's Portage build system. We run a slightly modified version of Chrome for Linux as our main UI. So a lot of times people look at me kind of crooked and say, you've spent a whole lot of time making Linux apps run on Linux. And uh, at their core, they're kind of right. Uh, there was a lot of complications in doing this uh, in a way that preserved Chrome's core driving principles, speed, simplicity, and security. Security being the big one that we really didn't want to mess up. Chrome OS has been at the forefront of desktop security since it launched. And we didn't want to take any steps backward on that front to add this new feature. <coughs> one of the key principles we have is that we don't let any unsigned native code access to our kernel. Like, there's too much kernel attack surface to expose to random code. So the only code that we run that isn't signed by us, that we're sure is safe, runs in a Chrome renderer process and is very well jailed. <clears throat> so to preserve that kernel protection layer, uh, we decided that instead of trying to make these Linux apps happy running in a jail, we would just give them their own kernel and put them in a VM. The solution we ended up with actually ends up with two Linux kernels and three complete Linux user spaces. So if you look at the overall architecture layout, uh, it looks like that. Um, <coughs> but actually, a uh, little bit more like this. You can see we've got our two kernels. There's, there's three user spaces, the, the main Chrome OS user space. There's a user space inside the VM which basically is there to bootstrap up an unprivileged uh, Linux container, which is our third user space that the users actually interact with. Uh, we're using stock upstream LXD to start the containers, which is nice. It gives us a lot of flexibility, gives us a lot of pre-manufactured containers that we can run. 
Uh, and <coughs> with that, we start a, a Debian uh, stretch installation up top. Uh, we've got our installation, which jails, jails the Debian installation. And then there's an extra boundary with the VM boundary, which is the boundary between red and blue in the, in the picture. And that boundary is the most important boundary. And to make sure that was as secure as possible, we went and really evaluated how to make uh, a virtual machine boundary that was as safe as Chrome's current security principles. And we looked at the available technologies and we decided we were gonna use KVM in the Linux kernel, uh, but that we weren't super happy with the user space options that we had. So we started from scratch and wrote a new virtual machine monitor uh, in a memory safe language. Uh, we wrote it in Rust, uh, just to give the maximum amount of protection we could from guests trying to escape into the host. <coughs> we called this new VMM cross VM because we were not creative that day. Uh, <coughs> uh, so this was, the principle of this was that it was really focused on security first. Uh, performance is important, Boot up time is important, but nothing, nothing trumps security. Have to make sure everything is as safe as possible. Uh, so the, the good thing about this is whenever the guest needs to request anything from the host, the normal, normal path is it pokes an event FD, something on the host side wakes up, and we have memory safe code written in Rust that does the parsing of all the untrusted buffers from the guest, et cetera, so we don't have memory overflows or weird exploits going on. <coughs> to take that a little further, we also decided to run each emulated device in its own Linux process. So when CrossDM starts up, it's got one main process. It actually forks off a bunch of children that can run in independent jails. They run in independent uh, sets of Linux namespaces with different views of the mount tree and with different access to different system resources. So the, the main benefit here is that our like Vertio random device, if it was to get exploited, uh, wouldn't have access to the networking stack. Only the Vertio network device has access to that. And if you exploited the block device, it couldn't get to the data in Vertio random. <coughs> so all of that combines to keep the guest away from the host. And uh, that's, that's great, that's really what we wanted, but in a perfect world, you, you would never need your guest to access your host, right? You could just keep that hard line there. But we really wanted to integrate things. We wanted to integrate the UI, we wanted to integrate files, uh, sharing and network, so we had to punch a few holes. And to do that, we added some host side daemons uh, to Chrome OS to help share things with the VM that we're running. Uh, the, the biggest one of those is there is uh, there's a Wayland compositor built into Chrome now, and we share that Wayland interface uh, into the guest. We've got a custom Vert.io device uh, that lets us have a zero copy display pipe from uh, apps running in the container in the VM out to Chrome. So you can get really good frame rates if you're doing video decode or playing a game. Uh, we added something to manage uh, the VM's life cycles. So Chrome by itself doesn't have privilege to start a VM. Again, just added a security boundary there. There's a separate process there which manages bringing up and taking down VMs as the user needs them. Um, <coughs> we added uh, Cicerone here is really interesting because it's the part that integrates the UI bits. So if you install an app in your VM, it notices that there's a new app in your VM and says, hey, maybe I should put this icon in your launcher. So now you can click on that icon and it just launches your app. Uh, and that communicates over uh, gRPC over uh, VSOC into the VM. Uh, finally, we had uh, file sharing access. So you can selectively, as Guido showed, uh, select files you want to share with the VM. So hey, I've got this thing in an email in Chrome OS. I'm going to download it. It's in my downloads folder. And now I want to edit it because it's you know a C file or something. And I don't have a good web editor for that. So I can click on it, share it in, it gets shared over 9p into the guest, and then the guest can open it up and edit it in Vim or uh, whatever they want. 
all these uh, host side daemons also need endpoints inside the guest, so they need somebody to talk to. So on top of our default uh, Debian installation that runs inside the guest, uh, we've added uh, a few. I'll do this one first. We've added a few <coughs> uh, daemons that talk to the host, and they're aware they're running in a cross Dean VM. Uh, the main one's called Somalia, and it's used to help X11 apps run against our Wayland compositor, uh, and to kind of bridge standard Wayland into something that works over VertIO Wayland. Uh, we actually have to ins run three of these, uh, one for standard Wayland apps, and then one for a, a low DPI, and one for a high DPI, because most X11 apps are awful at running at high-res screens like we have on some Chromebooks. Uh, and in addition, uh, to that, we added uh, Garcon, uh, which is the, the guy that talks to the UI component outside uh, of the VM. So this is the thing that notices when an application is installed and shuffles its icon out to Chrome OS or gets poked by Chrome OS and says, hey, please launch this application uh, or please install this application. So the, the VM we run, we call Termina. Uh, this is the thing that starts uh, inside the VM. So it, it contains the init for the VM. And we wrote a custom init that, uh, was, again, super stripped down, knows it's running on a Chrome OS machine, knows that its only job in life is to get LXD up and running and, and start a container and do some lifecycle management things. <clears throat> the, uh, once it starts, it, it brings up LXD. We've got one more daemon we wrote, uh, which is there to kind of bridge standard LXC container commands out of the container and out of the VM and into Chrome OS so that we can poke it with gRPC and it can, it can talk to LXD over its native interface. Uh, the main advantage here is that all this VM side code is completely read-only signed and trustworthy, so you can always get and start up to this point. No matter how corrupt you blow up your container or anything, uh, all this is all unmodifiable uh, and all signed by Google as well, so that you can trust it as much as you trust any code on your Chromebook. Okay, so that gets you to the point where you can run our default installation. Our default installation is, is Debian Stretch. Uh, it's, it's pretty basic. I, it suits my needs fine. It suits a lot of users' needs fine. Although, I imagine there's a few people who want to do something different or want to explore more what they can do in this room. Some people like different distros. Some people like to run Mint and all this other stuff. And we've allowed you to do a, a fair amount of playing inside the VM. So we're going to try to do a demo of one of these more advanced usages now. Thank you very much. Um, I'll try now to do a quick demo of this. If it doesn't work, I do have some slides. I'm going to publish then the slides with basically screenshots of the demo, but now I'm going to try to do it live. Uh, do you have an idea how I can just replicate the screen? Because it's going to be very hard. Like this, let me see. Do you know how to replicate the screen? Like you have one screen only? Yeah, you want to mirror it? Yeah, I want to mirror it. Uh, yeah, click on this. I just search for this place. Okay. That mirror channel display is a checkbox. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so um, we've already seen on the screenshots how to just install it and do it normally, but if you want to interact a bit with Chrome OS, you can just press Ctrl Alt T and this Chrome OS shell will pop up. Uh, is it big enough? Should I maybe increase it a bit? I'll, I'll increase it a bit. Oh, okay. Okay, should be better. Um, so once you have this shell, you can type 
a lot of different commands um, to like see and interact with your Chrome OS system, right? I'm going to just type VMC, and this tells you how to interact with these virtual machines. VMC list should show that there is one term in a virtual machine. You can create more. Uh, there is not a lot of need because then inside each termina they all look the same and you can create different containers. So right now I'm just going to type VSH and this allows you to join either a VM or a container inside a VM. If I type VSH termina, this just connects me to the Kronos user inside termina and this Kronos user basically can run LXC, right? So if I do LXC list, it shows my virtual machines. On a normal installation, you'll just see Penguin, which is the default container which runs Debian, uh, and its IP address, right? Um, from this, you can also see, for example, the networks, right? Yes. Funny. Uh, and you can just use LXE in various ways to study your situation, like as you would normally, and as you can check in the MAM page. Uh, one thing we're going to try to do is list our remotes. And this shows you basically, these are the default remotes that are published in Chrome OS. You can add more. Uh, images is like images on Linux containers. So if we use that, we should have a good amount of random Linux distributions. I am going to list AMD64 images that are available there. There's, yeah, good luck with the Wi-Fi. If it doesn't work, it's okay. I remember a few. Um, I don't know if we had a network connection here or something. Okay, we're giving up on that step. On a good Wi-Fi, like when not everybody is downloading their updated apps at the same time, it works. Um, from there, you can copy an image. So for example, Alexi image copy. Alpine Linux, which is very small on local. Luckily, I have already copied it, so it should work very fast just checking. If it doesn't, I'll just move on. OK, so it copied it successfully. It didn't have to download it because it already had it. Um, then I can go Alexi image list, and I have some like versions that I had already copied from before, but you can copy anything that you see in that images. There is Ubuntu, there is Mint. Like there's, there's a lot of various distributions, and otherwise you can find your own container images and just put them there, right? Um, just adding another remote. Then from there, I can just launch a new container, right? So now I'm going to launch it for real. So I'm launching an Alpine 3.8 container still because it's small, and I'm going to call it Alpine 1. I have a few that were already running, but this one is new. Um, yeah. So it's creating it, and it started it. If I list now, I used to have uh, Alpine 0, Alpine 7, and Penguin, where Alpine 0 and Alpine 7 I was just experimenting on, and now I have Alpine 1. And I can just connect to its console. Now I'm root on my new container. And of course, I need a bit of network, but hopefully. <laughs> Otherwise, I have a container that is already configured. You know, what am I to do? This morning it worked, but everybody was sleeping after the party yesterday. Unfortunately, in the afternoon, everybody's awake, and ah, it fetched something. We have a bit of time. At worst, we'll, OK, so I now have my packages available. Then I can go apk add apache 2. OK, not too bad. Thank you.
also open SSH. Maybe we'll just use a patch too. <laughs> Give it. Okay. It's fun. Then I can start them. I'll start as HD. Sorry, no. I'll start a patch. Um, I'll just add a user. Of course, of course. It's for a demo. I would use a real password, I promise. I could also have changed, you know, to allow direct root login without... Let's not do that, right? Okay, cool. Um, and now that we have that, I can go in my normal container, right? And then I can just go SSH on my new container. And that should automatically work. Of course, we trust it. And I'm in there. Or since I installed the patch too, I should be able to just open Chrome. Um, I don't know. It should in theory work at alpine1.linux.test. I haven't managed. Uh, exactly. So I just go LXC list. Alpine11 was this uh, IP address here. So I can just go in Chrome to my IP address. And it should just show me my default installation of a patch. This concludes. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Amazing. Um, and of course, this is mostly meant for developers, so you can publish your dev things and then try them in Chrome directly. Um, you can use it really for anything. You can run your little services, experiment, and so on. It's, at that point, you are free both on the distribution side, deploy your containers, pretty much anything except the things that we're still working on that I listed in the roadmap. Uh, this concludes our talk. There is some time for a Q&A. And we're going also to leave you our contacts and our list. Uh, so that, where is the present button? Here. So this is just what we've just done in the, really? Are you loading it from the network now? OK. So. Thank you very much. If you have questions, let us know. Oh, hi. I'm right here. I have a little question. Okay, I'll run to the <laughs> question directly. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, before uh, Christini was released, I was using something else called uh, Crouton, I think. Was it, it was like. Um, uh, well, uh, like a community, uh, for, well, so, someone who made it in his uh, leisure time. Did you did you collaborate it with with him, or is it? Did you use a totally different approach than what he did? Thank you. Um, from what I know, Crusini was inspired by Croton, but the approach was different to allow it to run in a non-modified, non-dev version of Chrome OS. Uh, maybe Dylan can speak more about that. 
but that's the small gist. Uh, yeah, we have several of the crouton maintainer types are actually on our team and had done that. So they contributed a lot of ideas and uh, we're excited to see us basically make a verified mode crouton, which is what we started calling this and hence the cross teeny name. Um, hey, uh, I've played around a bit with it, and as far as I understand, the port forwarding stuff is only between the container and user space, Sorry. and um, it's on. Okay. Okay. Um, so I've played around with uh, Crostini, um, and as far as I understand, the port forwarding is just between the Chromos user space and the container user space inside the VM. So there's no way for me to SSH in and out of my container to another device. Is that right? Or is there a way to do this? Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, that's, that's on purpose, uh, at least for now. We haven't come up with a way we're happy with to expose ports from inside the VM to the outside world yet. Just, it makes us feel a little creepy. Like We don't have any open ports now, and adding them is, is kind of scary from a security standpoint. Uh. Thank you for On the other hand, you can for sure connect from inside the container outside. You could do some SSH for wording or other things if you need to. Uh, this is mostly meant, again, as a desktop user space use case. So, I mean, if you want to run an Onion service of, on Crossing, you could, uh, and it would work, I guess. But the idea there is like you connect from there from your own machine, or among all the containers, everything also works, right? So you can SSH between different containers on your machine and so on. You cannot create a network of Chrome OS devices that, I mean, unless you have some other layer there and so on, but that's not by default for these reasons. Uh, I have two questions. One is uh, how strong is isolation between containers that are running on in the same yeah. VM or is it possible to have yeah. uh, separate uh, VMs for uh, each container? Um, and the second question about uh, GUI integration. Is it possible to extract uh, single windows or uh, from application running inside uh, those Linux containers or it's only just some full desk or yes. something? You can start multiple VMs and have N containers in each VM. Uh, I didn't quite catch the second part of that question. It, you, any of them can display Windows if you'd like. So they all get the connection to Chrome's Wayland uh, socket. Uh, but you need to, if you're going to run a non-standard container, you need to go do the plumbing that has those special demons I talked about running inside your, your non-standard thing so it can talk to our slightly modified Wayland protocol. Or, of course, you can port all of our tools for your favorite distribution. I have a little question about security. You said that you're trying to keep your uh, software as secure as possible. However, when you buy a Chromebook, the security update stops after seven years, between five and seven years. So how can you say secure? And is there a dependency between what you're proposing and also the Chrome OS you have on your computer? Uh, yeah, they, eventually they stop updating. Although, if you really want to keep using this ancient, ancient Chromebook, you can keep pulling builds and, and updating it yourself if you'd really like. And you can, you can sign it yourself, obviously. We're a big believer that the hardware is yours. You can go pull the right protect screw on your seven-year-old Chromebook and start signing your own things if you don't trust Google's signature either. So it, how secure it is is really up to you if you want it to be, or you can do the easy thing and, and let Google worry about it and buy one computer every seven years. Um, I have... I have a question too. Does this work on a Chromebook that isn't in developer mode? Sorry, could you say it one more time? Uh, does this work also on Chromebooks that aren't in developer mode? Yes, it works in developer mode. Everything that works in regular mode works in developer mode. It works in normal mode by default, yes. Uh, nice. Yeah, you don't need to be in developer mode. If you want to be in developer mode, you can be in developer mode. Uh, if you want to do some even wilder things, feel free.
So, I was, half my question was answered by the FAQ. It, it's not supported on the Chrome OS machine I have. So I'm, I'm wondering uh, why and if I did like try and build, um, do my own builds, like what would be stopping me from, what, what, what makes it difficult to support like a f um, 2013 pixel, a first gen pixel, which has like all the horsepower you would need to do VMs, but Google has stopped updating. Yeah, uh, our goal is to get it to as, as many Chromebooks as we possibly can. Um, yeah, we really do want to, to bring it to as many Chromebooks as is possible. Uh, there are some challenges on some of the older ones. Uh, some of them don't run the newest kernels and don't have some features that we need. And updating their kernels is rather expensive um, because there's too many bugs in new kernels. Uh, and the combination of the old kernel with the recent Intel speculative execution issues uh, has made it very hard for us to update some of those older big core devices in particular. So it, it's something we want to do. We're just trying to figure out how. Uh, could you say a bit about your approach about the GPU acceleration inside the VM? We're working on it. Uh, it, it's a it's a big chunk of work to get the GPU exposed into the VM in a way we're happy with from a security standpoint. Uh, but we we do have people exploring that now. So hopefully someday soon. It's about as non-committal as I can be with the schedule. I have a question about um, over here, uh, just about distribution of apps. I mean, if we have a Linux app that we want to make available to Chromebook users, but we don't want them to have to like bring up shells and get, go through that whole interface, is there a plan to have some sort of you know app store type of, of mechanism for installing apps? Uh, our initial pass here has been very focused on enabling developer use cases and not so much on app use cases. Uh, so. Today, that's, that's not really super smooth, right? So if I just want to go click on, a, on an install package, uh, it won't automatically get me through this whole setup flow. If I've gone through this setup flow and then I go click on a, I can double click on a .deb package and it will just install. Uh, but you still need to go through this initial setup, which is kind of a barrier as this has still got a beta tag on it for some good reasons uh, and it's really only tested for these development use cases. We wanted to enable people to develop web pages, develop progressive web apps, these types of things on a Chromebook uh, first, and then we're looking to expand those use cases in the future. Well, I'd like to encourage that, so yeah, thanks. Uh, have you looked at the performance overhead of running everything uh, virtualized? Do you have any numbers about it? Or? I, there, is a, there is somewhat of a performance hit. It depends on your workload. Uh, the, the biggest things are normally I.O. heavy operations that do a lot of VM exits. Uh, so if, if you're looking for like the absolute utmost performance from, from the hardware, it's not quite, not quite native, but it's really close to native, uh, and it's been fine. I've been using it as my only development device for months and months, and I've been, I've been okay with it for things like building kernels, building cross VM, building audio servers. Uh, things like building Android, I still go to my big beefy desktop. Thank you. Um, so in your Apache test, it was connected via HTTP and uh, IP addresses. Uh, and you can't open ports. You can't open ports, so uh, Let's Encrypt isn't really an option for HTTPS. I'm wondering if there are any thoughts to making like a local Let's Encrypt kind of style certificate authority that maybe Chrome would trust and some sort of way to create like local domain names that could then be used in that scenario? Uh, yeah, so for development, we, we trust the container like we trust localhost. Uh, so we're, we're cheating a little bit on that. Um, <clears throat> and that's, that's probably good enough for the use cases where someone is developing uh, a web page or, or a PWA. It, it lets you install PWAs, and that's, that was our main goal. Um, and we don't have a lot of plans to enable this as something you'd actually run a production service on. Because it's still just a laptop, right? It's, it's not, we're not looking to take over the server space here. Uh, great, okay. Thanks a lot, everybody.